host, Dr. Z. And Professor P. Dr. Z, who do we have with us today? Wow, we have a very special guest, Eric Lundberg. So Eric runs the local Milwaukee REI. Exactly. And gals and guys, I'm so excited that Eric has come on. He says, I don't really even do podcasts, but I couldn't say no to you. I'm like, wow, do I feel like so special and all of that, right? So, yeah, Eric and Brian had a coaching program. Now it's Eric. He's gone solo. But back in the day when I started, it was the two of them, and they, I went through their program. Incredible! Right? Because I was successful and a couple other people, and Eric will tell you all about it. But, Eric, where do you want to start? Holy cow. Well, first of all, thanks for thanks for coming out here. You are right. I was sharing with you before we started recording that going on podcast is something I, I don't I don't do, but I'm happy to be here both because I've really watched uh, your sort of transformation early on when you wanted to just become a real estate investor, but as you've then applied what you learned to life and now you've been helping lots of people, I'm happy to be on here, con- you know, helping contribute to both you and Zelda and, and what you're doing. Um, my background, um, yes, you, you know me from the Milwaukee RIA, uh, started it 15 years ago, uh, which is, it's really hard to imagine that I've been doing any one thing for 15 years, uh, but it's, that provides a good context, I think, to a lot of what I'm imagining you're going to want to be talking about today. Uh, over the course of that time, we've worked with more than 2,500 real estate investors in some capacity, right? Whether whether it was on an intense one-on-one level, like what we did on the coaching program, or it was a one-time visit, maybe where a person came through the door and and uh, decided that real estate was, wasn't for them. But anyway, we've had an opportunity to impact all those people. If I think about it and I recognize how many dollars and cents of, of uh, effort and investment and wealth people have made over those 15 years, it's probably measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I can't say this is a billion dollars worth of work, but to know that uh, by virtue of first creating an association that people can participate and learn from, and then you know, really just being the, the, the MC of it for all these years, even if it was a super micro uh, bit of influence on uh, so much of that in our community, it's, it's actually sort of humbling and, and I'm, I'm happy with, the, with that purpose that it's given me. I've, I've really enjoyed my role in the local community and, and really enjoyed my role in other people's lives because I'm sure there's, if there's one thing we talk about today, it's going to be how, how grows our business done properly. The right business really does allow for the right life and managing that balance and understanding that why and how we get there is takes a lot of work. And uh, what I know now certainly isn't the same as what I thought I knew 15 years ago. And I think that's the point as well. We're always learning and navigating. So thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I'm excited too, because I remember we started out with the ring, right? The Milwaukee mm-hmm. ring. Talk, talk about that a little bit, because um, we were both in that. And then you kind of had this idea that you wanted to go maybe in a little different direction or? Well, I think it was, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about it. So I I started uh, probably like you real estate investing in the early 2000s, um, bought my first uh, rental in our first property in 99, first rental in 2001. And, you know, uh, jumped into it full time by 2004. And I, I, I measure full time as I spent at least an annual salary's worth of money on education. So I went out and bought all these courses and uh, I wasn't getting paid for anybody else. So if that's what being a full time real estate investor is, that, that I was completely all in. Uh, and that was in 2004. And yes, uh, there was a group called Ring Real Estate Investor Networking Group run by a really, really good guy, Brian Fleming. Uh, it was a great group good organization and actually real estate groups way back then, we're talking two decades ago, right? Imagine what it would be like to get education and information in a space where Facebook doesn't exist, where the internet of course exists, but people are not, there's no online gurus, there's no influencers, people haven't cracked the code on flapping their lips and getting paid a lot of money. It was really people that were in the real estate space sharing what they knew and getting paid for it but it was a much, much smaller, smaller space. Uh, but that still meant that the groups were great, right? We'd have a couple hundred people and lots to learn. And I, in some ways, really the good old days of real estate investing, because you go and truly network. And when your only ability to connect with people was in person, uh, 
it made for a really special experience. So that was good. By 2009, when we started the REIT, a couple things had changed. First of all, the real estate market had completely crashed. Right, which had big, big impacts on our entire industry, and it had some impacts on, on me personally, which I can I can talk about because that's tied to sort of the why of it. Yeah. By 2009, uh, a, a real estate association group that was predicated on bringing in speakers and selling products to sort of exist, uh, they were falling apart real quickly because real estate investors were dying off, like dying off in droves. It was way worse than, than any uh, worst thing people would talk about in COVID if we're talking about metaphorically. Like the world not only uh, was sounding like it was ending, but it really was ending for a lot of people. We saw people going bankrupt. We saw people falling apart. It was a really, really hard time for people that had been in real estate for a while as prices changed. Uh, how that affected me is in 2008, I had you know several million dollars in real estate and about two and a half million dollars in debt. Uh, so I, I was a millionaire on paper, right? I had I had seven figures of equity and I had cash flow coming in, but by 2009 I still had that you know two and a half million dollars in debt. But now I only had two million dollars in real estate. So by 2009 2010 I found myself a half a million dollars upside down, wow. uh, which is a really terrible spot to be. That led to a lot of you know personal angst, like oh my god, once again my business plan didn't work. I'm you know failing and, and dealing with all of those personal challenges. And of course, you know, those who can't do teach. So I said, all right, well, I, I haven't figured this out. What I'm going to do is start coaching people nice. <laughs> on how to do real estate and create an association. And I think the real shift, the real shift, uh, what, what made a big difference in our association, I think was a, that authenticity of like, wow, I'm really coming up here having experienced these lessons. Let me share what we've gone through, how we're facing them and how we're getting past it so that people could avoid the mistakes that I've made so that I could learn from their mistakes and hopefully avoid them as well. And I think that authenticity uh, from the very beginning within the RIA, which was by, which was by necessity, right? It was, we started it in a tumultuous hard time. So if we had not been authentic, we would have had to been liars and it would have been such a drastic difference um, that there was just no option. And you know, for the last 15 years, that thread of authenticity, I think, is what's carried us. We share our real numbers. We share the real challenges. We share the real successes. It's a big part of how our mentoring program works, uh, but it's a real big part of the culture uh, as well. And so it's been a great run. Nice. So let's dig a little deeper into this. When you guys started it, I'm imagining that, because it was you and Dan Kraszewski, guys mm -hmm. and gals, Dan, and Eric started it together. Dan's got an incredible story. We don't have time for that one today, but so what was the mindset and how are you guys running that back and forth? Like this ring's good, but we can, we can see where we can make it so much better. How, how did that all come about, right? That's like taking a business from ground zero, right? Well, I think, so the, so the answer, and, I, and not a lot of people know this, uh, when we, so we were both ring members and happy ring members. Right. When we recognized that coaching was going to be part of what we were doing, we became vendors of the ring, okay. and uh, which, was, which was an appropriate, they had local vendors, and so we offered coaching, and which was fine because the ring didn't offer any kind of coaching program. Um, but as part of our outreach and as part of, of uh, you know, getting in front of the right people, we put together a bus tour, which we've been doing bus. We just had our last one last weekend. Uh, they're fun. We've been doing, I mean, I've been doing two, three or four of those every year now for 15 or 16 years. I recognize that we've, I've done more than 50 of them, which is, again, it's pretty cool because they're what a great way to get uh, a real sense of, of, of the actual market and what the business is all about. But uh, we we, uh, we did it. We had a successful event and uh, talked with leadership over at the ring. And they, they fundamentally felt like um, what we were doing was good, but they felt like they were having, uh, you know, Home Depot with Menard setting up tables inside the room. It kind of, it felt like there was a, a conflict for them that they didn't like. Uh, so our option at that point, and it was it was really amicable. Like I said, the leader uh, Brian, good person. It was a reasonable decision on his part. But fundamentally, it was thank you for being a vendor. Here's your money back. This isn't going to work out. 
Yeah. So, so we had that choice at that point, like, well, what are we going to do? We wanted to be coaches. We didn't necessarily want to run an association, but I recognize that just like your podcast now, if you're going to, you know, provide uh, help to people, A, you need to practice in front of them. You need to be, you need to be, need that accountability of, of doing good work and being shared. And part of that is having a platform. So for us, it was if we were going to continue coaching, and I didn't want to be like an online guru or, you know, flap my lips. We've never been marketing focused. We've always been community focused. Um, we had no choice but to start another group. And that was okay because our shift in the beginning really was everything I've just talked about. Um, I think the ring was part of his pressure probably was because the market had changed so much and so many people weren't renewing. Uh, and running events at that time, those are big, big, expensive. The hotels were very expensive. Um, and so fundamentally, it gave us both the excuse and the opportunity to create something new that would fill its own space. Nice. So starting out, what were some of your biggest struggles? I mean, you said you were, you kind, you knew a lot of the real estate investors coming out of the ring, but would you say the big? What were the biggest struggles uh, with the association, or what were the biggest struggles in my own real estate business? Yeah, in your own business. You, okay. You well, so I think that I think that starts even before then, right? I, when I when I started the real estate investing full time in two thousand four, we were buying properties. Um, two thousand four, five, six, seven. One of the things that really worked, but also led to the downfall, was. It, it was very easy. If you could create value on the buy, you could capture that value by refinancing later. So if I had a, a building that I, I bought for uh, $50,000 for, let's say, let's just say I actually had a whole bunch of these condos. Uh, that was a big part of my portfolio, had nearly 40 doors. And one of those would be a condo that let's say it was worth 50,000. I could buy those condos for five, 10, 15,000 improve them very nicely for another five, 10 or 15,000, and ultimately have a basis of somewhere in the mid thirties in each one of those. I could go to the bank and easily borrow 75 or 80% of that value. So I could get a 35 to $40,000 loan, which basically allowed me to have no money in the game after I had managed the cash management um, and, and have a loan. And I would do that again and again and again and again. In some instances, if the incentive was if I bought it cheap enough and I fix it up uh, for a good enough price, they'd still give me that thirty-five to forty thousand dollar loan. But if I only had twenty-five into it, it was ten thousand dollars of cash into my pocket, um, which was amazing. It was really amazing. And in theory, it was cash in my pocket that was going to be paid for by rent by uh, renters forever. And I wasn't concerned about the, you know, there was positive cash flow. I never really, I knew that prices kept going up and I knew that that wasn't uh, acceptable, but I never ever thought the prices would drop the way that they did. So fundamentally my business plan was predicated on get as much as I can, manage my cash flow through, uh, you know, capitalization, like going into debt. As long as it was debt that was being paid for by tenants, for a long time, it felt okay, but two things happened. First, I owned these rentals, and while on my on paper, I was making a couple hundred dollars a door times forty doors. I should be making seven or eight thousand dollars a month. That was a naive and, and immature and inexperienced perspective because the real truth, being a landlord in Milwaukee, uh, uh, when you don't have massive appreciation to carry you, the truth is tenants can be tough. Uh, people don't pay. You've got a you've got an economy where uh, jobs are a little bit hard. Rents could be a little bit low, and I found myself consistently not uh, not actually bringing in what the pro forma said I should bring in because tenants didn't move, or when they did leave, I had huge turnover costs, and so I was wrong in my numbers. Now, as a side note, the way I handled it, and the reason I knew I should not be a landlord was landlording really requires excellent. Uh, excellent project management experience. You need to do what you need to do every day to get it work. But when I had a tenant that that went bad, you know, and all of a sudden they didn't pay me seven hundred and eighty-five dollars that month. Well, four hundred of it was going to be expenses anyway. So I looked at it, it's like only three hundred dollars in profit or seven hundred dollars gross. 
well, I'm a real a dealer. I could make a heck of a lot more with my time trying to find a deal that I was going to wholesale or a deal that I was going to flip or another deal that I was going to buy, fix, refinance and pull $10,000 out, right? So I went down that slippery slope of focusing on what brought me more money and managing properties fundamentally wasn't, which when you have that mindset, you absolutely should not be a property owner at all. So that's a side note. What all of those things point to is I had a bad business plan. I was not, I wasn't doing the right work. I wasn't doing it the right way. And in 2008, when all of a sudden those condos went from being worth 50,000 to 40, then 30, then 20. By 2009 and 10, and there's hundreds of these condos I own, they were selling between five and $10,000. And my business plan was so much, this is the terrible part. My business plan said I was great when I was buying them for 30 or 35, but by the time that they were available for five or $10,000, I had no more equity. I had no more cash. I was completely enslaved to the debt. And it's a strong word, but I really was a slave to that debt. I, it dictated. If I didn't want to go bankrupt, which I didn't, if I didn't want to get foreclosed, which I wasn't, I had to rob Peter to pay Paul to figure out every freaking day how to get myself out of that debt. And I spent, well, from 2008 really until 2014 get, working hard to get out of that debt. Properties came up in value, sold them, figured things out. But it was a really long time of spending a whole bunch of energy, not dying, which is very different than spend, spending a whole bunch of energy really living. And that's what, that's what really changed for me by, by 2014, 2015. Can you talk about the stress level and how you managed it? Because doing all this stuff is so important. I I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that I had gone through your program. I immediately started lending right off the bat. And I here's a great lesson for you people that are out there thinking about becoming a real estate investor. Get somebody behind you that's a mentor or a coach that really knows what they're doing so they can guide you through the process. Because as a lender, one time somebody came to me and they showed me a spreadsheet of, well, I, you know, I had this many winners and I had this many losers. I'm like sitting there thinking, I, I've never had any losers. And I'm like, did you go through the program? No, I didn't go through the program. I'm like, well, if you would have, you probably would have been way better off. And one thing before you answer all that, I wanted to talk about the defining moment for me through your deciding on your program. You mentioned the bus tours, you've done like 50 of them. I will never forget. I'm chill, chills are running down my back right now, Eric. I'm walking to the car and I'm like, you know what? I can do this. I can make, I can be successful at this. So I just wanted to throw that in there to get motivate, inspire and motivate people that, man, if you're like, you know, get in the pipeline, start going to these events, find your local, you know, real estate meetup groups, get in there, start getting to meet people. It's funny, Zelda and I, we didn't talk to each other for a whole year. And then I remember, I don't know if it was you or Brian or who said it, but there, somebody said, probably you, dude, you got a network. I'm like, network? I am a freaking bookworm type guy. I'm the guy that's in the back of the room, standing by the wall, not wanting to talk to anybody. What are you talking about? <laughs> right? So I'm sorry I got off the rail there. But yeah, so tell us about this. I wanted to get that in because I really felt like it was important. Well, I, I appreciate it. I think you bring you bring a couple a couple important points there. First of all, mindset uh, being really critical. But before I guess before we talk about that, you asked about you know the dark moment or how I really handle stress. And I think it's good to acknowledge that mindset really is what plays because if there's one thing that life is sort of showing me at this point is good things, bad things. Um, you don't really know what's good or bad until way after the fact. So, so much of our suffering really comes to our perspective of what we're going through while we're going through it and ascribing it as something uh, particularly bad and act acting like it's something bad. And I think what, if there's any wisdom I gained over time, it's, it's sort of recognizing a, like this thing too shall pass, but also, um, recognize that if I'm following sort of the principles that I'm, I'm, I'm doing in my life and not adjusting all the time based on what I expect those outcomes to be, I can have a little bit more peace or sit with a little bit more confidence that we're kind of doing the right thing. And I think, I think, uh, I think those principles 
uh, those principles, for me, there's a mindset. And I think what I had to recognize, uh, well, here, I can, I can do my shout out moment. Um, in 2010, I was going through all this. I was coaching. I had my real estate. I was facing the challenges. And a friend of mine, um, a lady that I knew from Baltimore, her name was Andrea. She told me about a real estate investor group. Um, and there was a meeting in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Um, and she invited me to, she was flying in for it. And I went there and I listened to a, uh, an investor named Steve Cook. Yeah. And he was talking all about a concept that he built, which was called Life in Air. Um, common enough name, but the whole premise of Life in Air is rather than focus on making money, focus on building the life and then building the business to support that life. And I do think that he and that group saved my life, whether that's literal or just, uh, you know, uh, you know, an exaggeration, I don't know. But it profoundly changed my life. Uh, the stress that I was running into at that point, I, I talked about it, but my business had fallen apart. I had to take responsibility for having had a bad business plan. A lot of people were blaming the economy, blaming the banks, blaming all this stuff. But I, I don't really ascribe to that. I, I really think that there's all these external factors that are always happening, including today, whether it's politics, culture, big banks, anything. It's our job to recognize what's going on and to the extent that we can have a business plan that accounts for those things, that properly mitigates the challenges, ascribes risk the right way, and then do things the right way. And I recognize that I took entirely too much risk and that I was too dependent on things that I couldn't control. Uh, and I was really hard on myself. And so me facing that failure and really accepting that I had failed uh, was the hardest thing for me because I I'd, I'd had big, big wins in my life, uh, some ups and downs. And there's that saying, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, you know, maybe live in interesting times. Uh, I've always lived in interesting times. So I've had opportunities to uh, struggle and win and thrive and, and be excited and be hard uh, a lot. I, 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 I appreciate my life very much, but I'm not sure that everybody would say I want to copy that day for day. Um, anyway, that group and that mastermind, those 30 people of good people who just like myself had a business plan that didn't, wasn't working, right? They were capable of so much, but we were all suffering and we were trying to navigate this stuff. That group pulled me through it uh, through 2014, 2015, such that by 2014, 15, I was working with not only local people here, but working with other uh, other people as a coach for life and are helping other investors across the country. We had, I had people in every time zone and different markets. And if there's one thing that you want to do to grow as a person, try and help others because not only do you get to learn so much more, but, and I think this is just as important, at least for me, it's really hard for me not to take the advice that I'm giving other people. Cause we all know that it's easier to give advice than it is to take. And it's easier to say what to do than actually do it. But by virtue of, of, of kind of knowing what the right thing is and seeing it in other people and then having to do it myself, that's, that's made a really big difference. Uh, bottom line mindset though, to kind of pull it full circle is critical. Uh, we did it just this, we just had a bus tour. We had 35 people in there and we, this last weekend, and we were talking, of course, about real estate uh, and the specific houses that we showed and how it really would work. But so much of what I was spending my time on was really sort of making a case why like flipping houses still is such a great fundamental starting point in this business, not just because it forces you to learn, not just because it gets you connected with contractors, not because there's a million things that people don't understand about houses and you need to go through it. But also, if someone really accepts that they can make thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on a single flip, but recognize they need to do that because then they can reinvest in their business. Because if they have funds that they that they can go, it's those funds that can pay for the marketing that, that allows their business to thrive without them putting their time into it. It's those funds that allow them to perhaps leave their job or augment their job or something. And one of the things that Life Inner taught me, and one of the things I think that we've proven is this is this idea that people focus on wealth a little too early. When really what they need to be focusing on is, is that lifestyle design. Are they working as much as they want to work, but not more? Making as much money as they want to spend, but not less. 
right? And if by focusing on flipping some houses and doing that first, there's a lot of people. We've got students now, um, several that are that are consistently six figure earners, right? Because we all the graduates stay in and they become kind of part of the community and they're helping coach new people as well. It's a it's a cool system, but they're, you know, these graduates are continuing to earn hundreds of thousands, maybe not hundreds, but certainly in excess of hundred thousand dollars a year in what is very much part time job. Right. This is it's a type of business where you can work 10 or 15 hours a week if you're doing the right things consistently and replace a lot of uh, typical jobs, which is uh, which is a great thing. But people don't understand that they can do it. They think they have to do everything at the right time. They think that it can't be done. Uh, one of the powers of having like a local mastermind is we, we track everybody's time now. I mean, Patrick, it's what we do now is so much. You know, We're always iterating and growing. Right. Just like all of us. So what we can do now as a group is so different compared to like what you did early on. So my, my hat's off to you. It was sort of uh, when we were doing it, we were teaching you how to swim from outside of the pool. And the this, this success that was determined by first thing we did is we threw you into the pool yeah. and then we told you how to swim. And you, you were a great swimmer and you did really well. Uh, now there's you know a lot more infrastructure around people as they're figuring out. But Part of that infrastructure is we track exactly how much time it takes to get deals. Like literally we, every week, everybody tells how many hours they put in focusing on deals. We track how many dollars they spent to the penny of each week, how much have they spent? And then we combine all of that time and money into an aggregate. The value of that is, is really to give people the confidence and the, and the certainty. Like it's, it's sort of like there's true north. They can compare their effort with the average of everybody else. We don't share everybody's individuals, but we share the average. Yeah. And they can ask that question, am I, am I bringing the number up? Am I bringing it down? If the average group is doing this, why can't I do it? It gives them both the confidence to know what they can do because they can see what the results are, but it gives them the clarity to recognize that it's worth, it's worth sticking in. Um, but that mindset is, is barely fought for. But once you get it, it's, it changes your whole life. Actually, I was going to say, you mentioned Life and Air. <laughs> That's really where we really got to know each other was at the Life and Air um, that they did in Mad Madison. Yeah. That's when we like, sat down and started talking to each other. So it's so interesting. You That's know, great. And yeah, that, that organization and those people, they have really impacted so many people. You know, if, if we kind of come through life and with, uh, you know, whatever our soul group is, as we're kind of shifting through, I have seen how it has manifested in so many things. I mean, all over. It's amazing what the impact, right? And, and, and that's sort of what I can even think about, right? When sometimes I might be discouraged or worrying about things, recognizing that that first Life in Air event that was at ARIA was at ARIA, right? And so helping do stuff in Madison and those are those little micro impacts that we have. You guys are doing it right now. Right. Like as you're bringing these people in and someone listens and they get an idea and it impacts their life. This is this ultimate example of paying it forward. And that's why I so appreciate what, what you both are putting together as you kind of make your mark in the world. I was going to say, I think you said it, that you can kind of tell from your students kind of which ones are going to make it and which ones aren't. Like, do you have No, I said the opposite. I really said the opposite. When we meet with people, I, I try and... I try and talk about everything. I try and explain the reality of the business. Um, it would be the equivalent of this. If I owned a gym, we all know that actually like getting fit is pretty straightforward. You have to eat less than you, than you should and work out more than you otherwise would. If you do those two things, it doesn't really matter how you do it, but you're going to get good results. So if I was a gym owner and someone came in, I might, I might meet somebody who is pretty fit and they've, they've clearly been doing some stuff. And I'm like, Hey, I'm gonna help this person get jacked or I'm going to help this person really maximize or whatever else. Or you can meet somebody who comes in and they're, you know, they're perhaps overweight or they haven't been working out or whatever. Um, I have, you would think that the person who's already further down the path really would be the one that you could multiply the most. And sometimes you do, but sometimes it's that person who hasn't had much progress, but because that mind shift, or that mindset shift is there where all of a sudden their why has changed. You can find that that person who you have no reason to think that, that they really can do it all of a sudden absolutely can. And that really comes down to people connecting that, you know, if they're determined to succeed, they're going to. Right. 
And that's always an internal thing because everybody says they're going to. I, I can say that from personal experience. I've walked into many gyms and said, I'm determined to succeed, but it's not always the same results, right? Yeah, so to tag on to that, I don't know what you guys do with your, you know, when you're doing your initial interviews and stuff like that, but just, just to give you, I might have talked with Brian on this when we had him on the show, but what I think I mentioned was, in my case, my back was totally to the wall. I was going through the force. I don't know if you remember, I had to sell my house. The stress level was really high. That's why I love that we're doing a little plug for us here, our self-care masterclass 101. What's what's in your wallet kind of, you know, what's, uh, what do you need to work on, right? Or, way. or as you're climbing the ladder of success, you don't want to find out that it's, you put it on the wrong wall to be, to begin with. And to, and to finish up on that, Eric, I was highly, you talked about why. I was highly motivated. My back was firmly against this wall, and I'm like, it's either this or go get a cab driver job or something like that. Because <laughs> the career I was in, I was getting old. I didn't even want to do it anymore, right? So I was highly motivated to be successful at it. So maybe I'm thinking when you're talking to your people, because if they're sitting there, I read in a book, a guy said, you know, 99 people to one, if there's one person in there that's like in really good shape financially and all, and has success and has plateaued to a certain level, that person will have a much harder time of going to the next level because they've reached a certain amount of prosperity. And that makes total sense, right? Hmm. Sure. And I think there's a there's another common saying for that for people that might have some natural skill set where uh, good is the enemy of great, right? When you can already get by uh, and you're doing you're doing good, sometimes it's really hard to uh, to let go of that and do more. I think you're totally right. So I wanted to go back a little bit. You talked about that group. What was the name of that? I, it was the something that you were in with your 30 people. Sure, that was, like, that was a, a titanium group, which is a, a group within Life in Air. That's right. Yeah. So was there, I'm wondering how you totally had a dose of reality and not like pulled the one wool over your own eyes, right? And said, you know, how did you know the truth? Was there some truth or dare going on in the group where you would lay out a truth and they would call BS on you, or how did you? Was there a lot well, of that, so the, the, for, the format was we would, if there was 25 or 30 of us, we'd get together for three days mm -hmm. and we'd each take about a 45 minute turn and we'd go around and we'd give everybody an update and we'd talk about what we thought the challenges are. And like most things, the challenges that we think they are, if you if you listen to, tw if 25 other people are listening to you, they can call BS on you pretty quick. And here's what it usually look like. So my life's falling apart, everything kind of sucks, but let me tell you, if I could just get my marketing to work, then everything would be better. And, you know, people would listen to you for a little bit, and they'd be like, hey, so are you doing date nights with your wife? How's that going? What's your connection like with your kids? Mm -hmm. Right? I know you're here because you want to have this great life. What are you really doing in that great, great life? It sounds like you're working a ton. Is that what you really want? Why don't you show me what that vision of your life that you said wanted to be? How does this match? Show me this calendar of your week that you said you wanted to be. How are you? How close are you to living that? In those fundamental uh, mismatches, which we all, in between sessions or whatever, we can live that lie. We're like, well, I'm just going to work 100 hours a week right now so I can get there later. Or I'm just going to like not talk to my kids now. Or we see people like, I love my kids. I, I need to get this hundred thousand dollar super safe car so I can do this because I love you know. Actually, maybe your kids want to spend time with you more than they need to be in that you know super Mercedes. Point is, there is a lot of holding up a mirror and truth telling. But you've got to also remember, it wasn't just the feedback that we would get as you listened and watched other people have their own struggles and that mismatch. What that started to do is it gave you permission to recognize, okay, I'm not the only one. Yeah. I'm not, I don't suck. It's not just me. I'm not a loser. I'm not a failure. Because that's the, that mindset and that negative loop that you have with yourself when you're struggling yeah. and you think, oh, well, they're better than me. That is endemic for most people. It's certainly in a lot of men. I absolutely struggled that with that a lot. Like no matter how much I could do, I always felt like, oh man, I just suck. And 
over time, right, as you realize that, and you realize that that's this lie that uh, you program as a way to do it. And you, you think you're motivating yourself and you, you recognize that it's a mindset shift. So it was caused then to do a lot of the personal work, right? I, my business has grown um, as I've gotten older, not because of all the real estate stuff that I do. Um, it's grown because of the personal work that I've done working with, you know, either counselors or working with coaches to really go in and work on the inside stuff. Cause to the extent that we can control this and, and Patrick, you and I have sat and you've given me advice and that sort of counsel is so impactful on the life, on the business in part, because the business job is to serve that life. And that's what really helps with what you guys are doing. So how, how are you choosing to challenge yourself? Like what's, what's coming up next for you? Well, one of the things that I decided uh, last year, it was actually a, a, one of my, well, not really an employee, an independent contractor or employee, team member that was that was here for years, a local guy named Tim, good friend of mine. He, he pointed out to me a couple of years ago, he's like, because we're working on all of our numbers and we're getting all of our KPIs. He said, Eric, this is just ridiculous. We need to start measuring your company based on how many mountains you've climbed per year. And that's it. Like fundamentally, if we don't start adding that factor on the board, um, then this is all bullshit. And I quit. Like he didn't, he literally was like, this is, you know, that is putting sort of that truth telling. He's a great truth teller. Uh, so starting last year, um, we started making those commitments. Uh, we've climbed Mount Baker. We took a group to Machu Picchu and did the uh, Inca Trail. Uh, just a couple months ago, I climbed the top of Kilimanjaro. Wow. And in July, so about two months from now, I've got a group of six people and we're, you know, I, I, I'm spearheading it, getting people to come with me. So now I can't back out, mm -hmm. bringing a guide with us that's going to make sure we get there because I won't be able to do it on our own. But we're going to climb to the top of the Grand Teton, wow. uh, which involves ropes and harnesses and 3,000 foot drops, which my hands have started sweating just saying this out loud. Um, but it's that idea, if I wasn't challenging, if I wasn't committed to doing something that I didn't know or challenging myself to do something that didn't scare me, I know that I wouldn't continue to grow. Uh, so there's that component, which gets me on a day to day. Um, and then the last piece for me is I've recognized for myself, um, I turned 50 in, well, I, it's exactly 36 months from 36 months and a few weeks from right now. And our entire team here, and I, I'm really blessed to have truly both built so I can take some credit for it, but then I've also been just gifted some great, great people to work with. Yeah. Uh, and, but our entire team knows that our business, as we're shifting and growing, it's predicated on I'm doing, uh, I'm out the door in 36 months from today. And next month it's gonna be 35 months and we have it it's written down and it's clear. doesn't mean I'm going to be gone, but I will no longer be required. Our business will shift, uh, shift it where I won't need to be here in the office. Yeah. And my plan is to uh, I have a, well, I don't know. I call it my Bill O'Bagan's birthday party. I'm going to turn 50 and do a big bon voyage and then get in a car and head to Alaska. Yeah. And I'm going to go to the tippy tippy top as far as anybody can drive north. And then I'm going to start working my way down to the bottom and take a year or two and go to go to the absolute bottom of Argentina and, uh, and work remotely while I'm doing that. It's been a dream my whole life. Wow. And it really, it's actually been entirely wonderful for it to focus business around meeting those goals because it changes. It really changes what we're doing as that why became crystallized. So me saying it right here on a national podcast where it's recorded, this is just for my own damn accountability. I want, I want to, uh, I want to know that three years from now, no one looks that up and like, well, was he full of it or not? And hopefully uh, they'll find out that I wasn't. And then I'm here. <laughs> Dr. Z, any reflections? 60 seconds. we got to cut to the quick here. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, Eric. I really enjoyed this kind of a walk through time. <laughs> yeah, it was thank awesome. You. Wow. The, yeah, you know, yeah. I read, read a book the other that Marcel we're having on next. He read, wrote a book. It's so good. Unthinkable, Eric. Here he comes again. Here he comes. <laughs> this is good. This, so, Marcel, this is perfect timing. They were just telling me about your book, Unthinkable. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, that was perfect timing. I just yeah. mentioned it. Unthinkable, right? But this out, 45 minutes, whatever, 40 minutes we've been recording here has blown by. And I was going to say that's kind of the way it was with Marcel's book. It was a page. It is a page it's turner. A page turner. And I shot through it so quickly. <laughs> Incredible. So all we're right. going to have to leave it there. All right. Yeah. And as always, thank you in advance. <laughs> Bye, everybody.
everybody. Thank you. Just thinking and growing and learning and knowing and thinking and growing and learning and knowing. Yeah. Just thinking and growing and learning and knowing and thinking and growing and learning and knowing. Yeah. Yeah, we're thinking and growing and learning and knowing and thinking and growing and learning and knowing. Yeah. We're thinking and growing and learning and knowing and thinking and growing and learning and knowing. Yeah. Thank you.